Hi everyone, today is Wednesday, October 14th, and today is the design team meeting for the adult, what are we calling ourselves? The Open ABE MOOC design team, that's a mouthful. And tonight's agenda is pretty much in the hands of the designers. Uh, we have a rough framework where we're gonna run through the, um, the weeks as we initially laid them out with, um, with what we're hoping to have the learners in the MOOC accomplish. And so with that, um, I think I'll kind of stop talking and let everybody just um, kind of give me a, a heads up on how your meeting went and um, what kind of what approach you guys have been taking to start tackling this, um, this design challenge. And then from there, we can kind of start breaking it down in, into the weeks of, of what people want to talk about. But someone take the take the reins and, and give, a, give a little overview of how your, your first meeting went. <laughs> This is not a quiet group. I, I know. I know it's not. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering if you're maybe one uh, expecting me to be the spokesperson for the group. So I'll just jump in and, be, and uh, go for it. And do that. Um, so we we have had a, a couple of things, and the sure uh, that we've come up with. Um, we've talked about having a module zero that kind of outlines the entire design plan and has an advanced organizer for our learners. Um, just to let them know, it's, I, I think typically when I land in a MOOC, I'm not always sure what to expect. And so I think our part of our thinking around the, the module zero is, you know, this is what this first five weeks is all about. And this is what the outcome of that's going to be. Um, and then having a, a fairly consistent rhythm throughout all the weeks, but really the thing actually is stemming from week four, which is the, the actual design uh, proposal. Mm -hmm. And week one through three feed all of the components of week four. And then week five is about fine tuning all of those, having an opportunity for feedback from peers. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll pause there. Um, just for the general overview of it, and maybe we can have uh, John and Eric speak a little bit about week one. Yeah, um, for week one, Eric and I um, are tackling really um, dissecting the instructional opportunity. And um, so we want to make sure that um, we understand who the personas are, who the audience is, um, what the need is, and what the context is going to be. Eric and I have had a lot of conversations. One of the things that we do believe that we have to do in this week is we have to give a lot of information. Um, it's going to be very tough in this week to have the learners come up with who the audience is going to be, um, the need, and the context. So what Eric and I are planning to do is we're going to do a combination of um, giving them knowledge, giving them, feeding them what these are, but then leaving enough holes in it where they can fill it in and feel that they're part of the process. Um, we we want to begin the week with a visual thinking exercise. Basically, we, we show an image and we ask them to look at that image and tell us what that image is about. What's the context? What's happening? Who are the people? What are their hopes, dreams, fears? What do they want to accomplish? Give them some names and really start to understand that when we look at the context and the audience, we, we're really looking at them as people um, and we really want to begin to um, have, have a persona discovery process where they understand the learner more than just demographics. Um, and each day we're going to tackle one. So we're going to start off with personas in the first day. The second day we're going to go to the, the need. And the third day we're going to go to the context. With our fourth day really becoming this, this bringing it all together and, um, and, and having them say, okay, you know, are there some holes that need to still be filled? That's okay if there's going to be. Because um, Eric and I want to make sure that we provide some resources to them that they can start to look um, further into some of these areas and then we want a little bit of a validation we want them to leave week one saying you know what I have a really good feel for these three things um, and I feel that I can move to the next week one of the things that we talked about as a group 
And one thing that we want to make sure that we kick off in week one is this whole idea of reflection, Uh giving these people the opportunity to reflect on not only what's happening in their week, in that particular week, but also how that may tie into the next week. So if we can get them towards the end of our week reflecting and saying, okay, this is what I understand from this week. I have a good feel for it. And how is this now going to translate and move me into the second week? So if you kind of use that process, then you can almost think like in the second week, you're kind of reflecting on your week, how the first week tied into it, and then how that moves to the third week. So that's sort of how we all thought that the reflection could really work well together. Um, but just as a recap, Eric and I, again, we, we feel that that our week has to have us giving them some information, but we want to do it in such a way that um, they have this opportunity to get some groundwork, but then also build on to it, especially where they feel that there may be some holes in there. And, um, and then we really want them to lead the week with a validation saying, yep, we understand the need. We, we have a good feel for the context and we feel that um, we understand who our learners are going to be um, and we have enough to work with that as we move it on. Yeah, and you and I talked about that, John. Um, I think when you first were talking about coming on the project, is you know, we only want them to have a couple hours time on task per week or whatever it may be. And so, unfortunately, then they don't have the luxury of doing their own, <laughs> you know, you know, right? Needs analysis or whatever. And so, I think that is a great workaround. Is there will be a certain degree of content dump, but at the same yep. time, then they re- reflect upon that in the activities that you have them doing. So, I'm totally on board. And then I just wanted um, to mention, I don't think we've had a chance to. I have not. Had had a chance to talk with you folks um, formally after I confirmed with the Canvas people that we actually can con- continue to stay the full whatever ends up being 10 weeks in the MOOC where we thought there was going to have to be that kind of weird um, you know, break and then move to another platform. That was just misinformation that Canvas, the, my initial contact gave me. So if it turns out, and this applies to anybody, um, if it turns out you feel like you need more time, like for example, if you and Eric now want to take week one and two and then we'll kind of shift everybody down, um, I, I think we've got a little more wiggle room than I originally thought. So everybody kind of keep that in mind as well. So I, I'm totally on board. And I just to circle back to, I, I'm already on page two of my notes. So if I get too far <laughs> I'm, with my feedback, I, I'm afraid I'll forget stuff. But I love the idea of module zero. And, and I'll definitely come back to that because uh, we have to get a, a preliminary module of, of ready by December 1st for Canvas to review. They just want to make sure that we actually are doing what we say we're going to do. And um, I don't know if that will be a good candidate for that, but that potentially could be. And I love the idea um, because that's going to be one of the harder things by us having a, a longer MOOC, like a 10-week MOOC, <laughs> is to give them a sense for, you know, please stick with us because we, we swear it's good if you, at the end. And <laughs> here's what you'll be, be doing if you stick with us. So I, I, really, I really like that idea. Yeah, um, it seemed, I think, I think we, we started to feel that when we were talking because we were like, well, people are going to come in and they're not going to know what the goal, the, the end goal is of what they're doing, right, of the bigger project and how the different weeks go together. Um, so I think too, John looked at the SME surveys and I think he found a lot of interesting things there, at least for us. I don't know if the other groups have or not, but, um, he saw things and this is why we were also saying we need to give some, we're just going to provide some information here is because there were things that came up that we don't have expertise in, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. But people need to know, right? So some people may be in prison, right? Like, right. Are you designing for people who are in prison? Um, so that's not going to be everyone, but that might be one of the personas. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think um, we did not ex- uh, say that we were going to two week zero. <laughs> <laughs> You just like the ideas. <laughs> you like the ideas as long as someone, yeah. Um, kind of like writing a paper. Maybe that is actually the week that's done at the end, right? Yeah. Out, right. Yeah, but um, but I I think I think that's a good idea. Um, I think right now what we are planning really is, you know, f- for week one without giving an, in- we weren't going to give an introduction, right? We're going to mm-hmm. jump right into the these are this is the personas. Right. It's going to be four days, half hour each day. Um, and um, it'll do the personas and it'll do the need. And then 
I'm missing something. The context, Eric. Thanks, context. Little scrambled still from yesterday, but I'll get back to my normal <laughs> style. <laughs> uh, the context. And then that third half hour, right? That would be them really reflecting and putting something together so they'd be able to take that into week two. Okay. And so um, in, in terms of kind of, I'm kind of getting a, a little, uh, kind of my little matrix in my head. So we've got reflections, which will be like individual things that they'll work on. And, and I think I like the idea too, um, that that strings along throughout the process. So I talked to the folks at Canvas as far as what tools there may be available. And that's a big question mark still mm. on, you know, how we would actually um, facilitate that using the Canvas infrastructure. So let's kind of keep a, you know, a mental note on that to, to circle back on like physically, how will that happen? Um, and then we're were you have you guys and we'll start with you guys and anybody else can chime in um, thought about any ways of utilizing like the discussion boards um, or anything like that would that come into play at all with you, within the first week at all having discussions about your topics well I guess for me my and and maybe blowing this out to more time might change that um, but I guess for me, my first kind of like inclination was like, oh, this is just a half hour at a, at a shot. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, right. If they're discussing, are they discussing week to week, day, day to day? I mean, they're not going to do this synchronously, right? Right. So it would be probably something like a question prompt in the you know early part of the week. Like I was just thinking for just this is totally off the top of my head for your week. Um, well, we're probably going to have a fair a fair share of adult educators. And so it may be interesting to hear their perspective on give tell us what your context is like or a context either you've been a an educator or potentially even maybe a student, you know, sometimes that we get people um, who have you know, taken the GED or whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, share your perspective on what the context is like from your experiences. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know that in the MOOCs, they do a lot of uh, peer review. So I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. I'm just kind of mm -hmm. throwing things at the wall right now, but I guess that could be, you know, like, what do you think your, you know, your persona looks like and in what context is it and what's the need. Mm -hmm. I guess you could have people peer review those like mine's similar to that. Mine's different to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do think that Josh's week, which is week five, um, kind of speaks to the discussion board piece a little bit more. Okay. okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. That's great. No, you guys are great. So do you, anything else for week one or whatever it ends up being <laughs> week one and one a or whatever. <laughs> Did you yeah. have anything else, John? I I, I think that's that, that's basically our plan. Yep. yep. Yeah. Well, the other thing, Jennifer, is that we know that you know one of the things that Eric and I talked about. And Eric had a great idea with it because we, we we know that we we're, we have to kind of bring in two different audiences, right? The ultimate audience is those that are going to be taking the GED, but then we also have this audience of you're designing something so that adult basic educators can use this module and possibly use that. But um, to, to keep those separated, we're going to bring that, that, that adult basic educator audience up in the context, in the instructional context, okay. so that they don't lose sight of that, but then making sure that we keep the end user, that um, person that wants to take the GED in the forefront. So we have a way of not mixing everybody up on dealing with sort of two audiences. That's, that's an excellent point. And I think actually, Eric, you brought that, that up. I think the first night we were all together, you're like, who is our audience? Yeah. And I, I think we do have kind of a tiered uh, yep. deal where it's the kind of the, the person who will be actually using the, utilizing the resources, yep. um, accessing them are the adult educators, but as you're saying, the end user is really yep. the student. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, Jennifer, it's, it's really kind of a meta <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of like question, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> You know, as I'm designing for the people who are going to be designing, right? Yes. I need to know who they are yep. um, to design the piece to show them how to design. So, <laughs> um, and on top of that, you know, I'm, uh, I believe strongly in modeling. So if, if I'm going to give them a course, I wanted a course of like, oh, well, I could use it. This is a good example for what I need to do when I'm actually doing it with the people trying to get the GEDs. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then it gets but, even more confusing when we talk about our learners and we're actually talking about the MOOC participants, right? <laughs> it's like, right. whoa, we got like 
several layers. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it was Stacy, you know, Stacy was saying, I didn't have quite in my head, but she was saying, you know, the end goal of this is to have people who can create lesson plans for people wanting to GED. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking of it a little bit differently. I was like, oh, I thought we were trying to have them design their own modules or their own courses or something. Um, yeah. So I had a bigger picture in my head. Yeah, and you know that's a, it's probably a, a good uh, place to kind of dwell on that a second. So we have the other team that's working on kind of thinking through what it is uh, the deliverable is going to look like and where we're going to house it and things like that. And um, we've really been gravitating toward the, the way things are structured in OER Commons. And so again, very much geared toward the audience, primary audience being the adult educators to go. And when they, ref when, when Stacey refers to a lesson plan, I had a conversation with her offline, a uh, separate phone call about this as well. Um, I think we have, we do need to kind of define our language because I'm thinking of it a little bit more maybe simplistically than she is where instead of it being a lesson plan, it's more um, instruction and almost like an instructor guide for how to use the materials that we've created. Um, I was probably thinking along, I come from K-12 originally, but I, I think I'm probably a little more aligned to your thinking from what I hear you saying. Yeah, and we should we will def, we're definitely working on that with the other team as well, like thinking through, you know, what will this and I, actually everybody's opinion is very welcomed and valid here. Um it, like you're saying we all come from different um age groups and um and backgrounds and words mean different things. Yeah. I've actually never yeah. created a lesson plan in my life, but I do a syllabus and I do, you know, <laughs> other things like that. So um Yeah, and you know, I I've, I've made plenty of lesson plans but I can't hand in a lesson plan in an instructional design class, right? Like th these are different things. Right. Yeah. And so really what I think at the end of the day, the, the folks that take the MOOC, our MOOC participants will be designing a, a half hour instructional module. So it's the actual, you know, practice or presentation, practice activities, uh, feedback, assessment, whatever it may be. So they'll be creating resource, uh, a resources that the teacher will be able to use in the thing. And then I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward it will then be some type of overlaying instructor guide to give a description where this would fit in, what age group it's, group it's appropriate for, what standard al it aligns with, things like that. Sure. So, okay. I'm working on a project with um, some engineers that are doing a similar thing as well. So it's, um, you know, the, the instructors have to create the lesson plan per se and then fit it into a larger um, OER repository. So. That's very interesting. So is that kind of what you do? Like when you determine a lesson plan there, or um, I think you're calling it a lesson plan, uh, were you thinking of it more as like an instructor guide or how did that? How, yes, yeah, so theirs is a K-12. Um, so it's it's a master course for K-12 engineering teachers and they construct it uh, as a lesson plan for the classroom environment. So I don't know, it, it, there's some similarities, but uh, okay. I don't know if it really matches. Okay. Think about it. <laughs> Okay. Does that sit well, pretty, pretty well with everybody though, that that's what the del final deliverable will be, that it'll be something. <laughs> the squishy part, I guess, is a little bit more in, in terms of how much definition we add to this lesson plan. Um, anybody have any thoughts on that? Maybe, maybe this wouldn't be a bad time to talk about that a little bit with this group. Yeah, I, I think kind of where I was at, because I, I, I'm working with a, another OER group too, and, and nomenclature seems to be a, a sticky point. So we talked about like lesson plans versus learning plans as well. And so I think the, the context I was operating under is that there would be less, there would be assets for the lesson, be that a, a PowerPoint or some kind of learning activity that's structured, but then also the lesson plan that that goes through a, a set body and conclusion um, defines what standards it's aligned to defines what assessment might be tied to it um, so that it's it's both sides of it it's it's not only the the steps that you go through within your 50 minute session but also that includes the assets that are required for that for that 50 minute session. Yeah, I really like, you know, I'm gonna steal that word, the assets. I really like that, because that, 
that gets it to the heart. Our prior service learning groups have pretty much created the assets. That's really what they've been up to this point in, in our prior cohorts. And we really hadn't spent as much time on kind of how does this all fit into the larger lesson and like how, as you're saying, the, the standards it's aligned to and, and um, and things like that. So I'm, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to be calling it then the <laughs> the assets versus the lesson plan. I let or learn. What, then learning plan. You're right. That kind of maybe even brings us into another area. But um, okay, very good. All right. And unless we had any, anybody else had any preliminary thoughts on that, let's let's move on. So what do we have for week two? Um, is Stacy and Jr. So I'm about to put a whole bunch of words into Stacy's mouth. Um, okay, that's so good. For, forgive me for that. Um, so it, she's done a, a lot of work on um, on kind of the our our week is in three main sections, and so what you'll notice with all of the weeks is that um, it's not Mondays are all the same, Tuesdays are all the same, but there is a little bit bit of flexibility more in terms of part one, part two, part three, because of the scope that's involved with the topics in each week. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the beginning of our week, Stacy will lead in with uh, a section, uh, a couple of kind of what we call the reads mm -hmm. on defining, a, defining her less, defining the lesson scope. Um, and what's all involved in that? What are the key questions for defining what the scope of the lesson is? And then she has a, a reflection activity um, that'll prompt students to, or our learners for the MOOC to identify, you know, have I done this before? How often have I done this before? Am I comfortable with it? Um, and our group as a whole has, has had, a, I think, a fairly lengthy discussion in terms of, well, who is our key audience for the MOOC? Are they people that understand what a lesson plan is? Have they made it before? Could they be people that are kind of wandering in off the street per se um, versus people that uh, are in K-12 to or higher ed or instructional designers, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So I think the beginning of Stacy's uh, first two sections really are grounded in that is, is how do you know how much fits within a certain theme or a certain time frame that you have to deliver a lesson? Mm -hmm. um, the second part then she, and I guess at the end of the first part, they establish a learning goal. So it's not, it's not drilled down to an objective level yet, but they have an idea of what, what the learning goal would be mm -hmm. for the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, and then identifying uh, what standards that that might be in alignment with. If it's the um, college and career readiness uh, standards or the GED and I'm about to show off how Canadian I am because I don't really <laughs> know all of the differences between, uh, between all of those standards. Uh, things are a little bit different <laughs> across the border. Um, but that's, that's the focus of, of the second part um, that she has. And then the, the third stage in week two is about uh, OERs. And so I'm glad that you brought up OER Commons because um, that's really what I've been, I've been spending a lot of time there and, and see all the little check boxes that they have in terms of categorizing things as activities and labs or assessments or uh, curriculum and instruction, et, et cetera. So um, the first part is a, a watch slash read of defining and defining what OERs are and where to find them. Um, and thank you very much for the, the big list of repositories from the SMEs. And I've also contributed some other repositories that, uh, that I've come across. Um, and then a, a briefing on Creative Commons. Um, I know that it's uh, sometimes taken as, as common knowledge in ID. But again, I was thinking about people that maybe haven't, haven't always, haven't come across Creative Commons that, um, that much yet. And then uh, very recently, the EROTL, so the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning, mm -hmm. which is out of the universe, um, Athabasca yeah, University. Yeah, exactly. Um, they recently had a review of different uh, OER rubrics. And so what I've done is built an activity into the end where they, um, they take the learning goal that they have established and they go into an OER repository and they say, okay, what, what already exists? And I have a, a marking rubric here that I, or a, a rubric that I can look at a, a current lesson plan and say, is it exceeding or deficient in a certain area? And, you know, does that lesson plan 
will I create one from scratch or will I add to one that already exists? And so trying to keep that whole theme of OER of um, really focusing on the adapting or the enhancing aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that really chews up a, a large portion of, of our two hours that we have allotted for that week. Mm -hmm. But it, um, uh, I've, I've actually adapted one of the agile rubrics for evaluating an OER to do that activity. So it's kind of a show by, you know, demonstrating that this is how you can adapt these things. Oh, that's awesome. And you know, this is so, so timely. Um, we, we met last week with the other group and came to the cons consensus. We were doing the make versus buy decision last week. Do we go with OER Commons or do we go down the path of um, building something out on WordPress or whatever it may be? And you know, right, maybe down, and, and we can't have a lot of a really interesting discussion, which if you wanted to listen to, <laughs> but you know, one, one of the uh, designers mentioned, wow, we're, you're starting this new nonprofit. Don't you want to brand it under something and, and control it, whatever. But then there's the whole Whole issue of uh, administration and hosting and you want to get involved in that so anyway long story short with with where we came to the conclusion we were going to go with OER Commons but then this week we've noticed some deficiencies and maybe you can um, address or answer some of these if you've spent some time in there um, it, at this point it looks like you can only align resources to the Common Core versus college and career readiness standards so we have a question into them on that um, and we don't know if there's a workaround if we create our own hub which I think you probably have played around or seen maybe the hubs and the microsites and things like that. But are there, in your opinion from poking around, do you think we are on the best path sticking with OER Commons or have you found another repository that you think would also be uh, good for us to try to consider to, consider to possibly align with? I, I think OER Commons is kind of the big player in the area, but I did also, when Stacy and I were talking about standards, I did notice that's probably where my language around the standards um, popped up was that I was looking for one that wasn't in their drop menu. Right. Um, and so that, that is one possible restriction. Um, lately, I've also been diving into the um, kind of metadata around what you put on uh, OERs for accessibility and for tagging. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't know if if the uh, adult learning zone crew wanted to do their own say WordPress site and, and something that they posted themselves, then what kind of tagging would be included in that? So um, these things have been on my mind. I don't have uh, a discrete, you know, really nice, simple package yeah. solution for it. Yeah, we haven't um, either. <laughs> yeah, cause yeah, cause that was, we were going down that path of having adult learning zone. I even bought the URL adult learning zone.org and then same exactly what you're saying, you know, figure out our own taxan taxonomy and tag everything so it can be picked up. But that, you know, just hosting your own website, we all know is brings with it its own challenges, especially when you start <laughs> loading it up with tons and tons of content. Um, but then to your point about the metadata, they, that's another, uh, one of the designers was thinking that we may be able to tag our resources in a way that we can kind of do a workaround, even though it's not in that pull down, as you noted, um, there may be a way to do a workaround using tags and things like that. So, okay, excellent. Exactly, and the, the really nice part about OERs is it doesn't have to live in one place. It can live in an infinite number of places. So that adds a layer of complexity, but also avoids some of the limitations we might run into with having it only in one place. Yep. Excellent. And again, um, we may be, maybe we're going instead of calling these weeks one and week two, um, I think we may be calling you guys module two and giving you a week and then her, uh, Stacey a week. Um, I think for me, at least as an instructor of instructional design, I think one of the hardest topics is the one ta Stacey's tackling, trying to get a, a novice designer to get their head around scope um, and what it means to prepare a 30 minute lesson there there's always like too much <laughs> that usually is what ends up happening is you feel bad but they've created like three times more um, material <laughs> than they need for the um, the time allotted so that may take her a little bit longer than you know an hour or whatever you guys have allotted for that so again same comments that I gave with week one if, if you feel you need to to have your own week um, you know, we'll, we'll, we can talk through that as well. But otherwise, it sounds great. It sounds wonderful. Did anybody else have any questions for the um, for for this group? All right, all right. Thank you so much, Jr. for for doing that. And Felice, you're on you're on deck. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, English is my second language. Please do not hesitate to ask anything if you don't understand. Please. You guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you perfect. Yeah. Okay. Very loud and clear. That's fine. Okay. Cool. And I have three main parts as well. One will be the f the first day is gonna talk about the learning outcomes, the um based on the Merrill info about parts about kinds of how to and what happens, and then the second day is gonna all about the the principles, the activation tell, show and demonstrate, application ask, and the integrate integrate and do. Mm -hmm. And the third day will be about what they do need to consider when they are making a decision about an instructional activity. It's going to cover time, how much time they have, how much their learners have knowledge or experience, or how much there's like an existing material, they can access the material. And the, and the last, the fourth one is the technology availability. What type of materials they have for their learners when they are designing they have to consider those and the, um, the fourth day is going to be mostly practice and I don't know if I am allowed to but I would like to um, I'm gonna also I will use these four principles when I am designing the course and for the activation tell I'm gonna tell them the goal of the module at the beginning and I'm gonna talk about how I'm, I'm trying to, as it's on the page, it's on the website, I'm trying to connect their prior knowledge, their real life experience with the income, with the new knowledge I will be teaching. Mm -hmm. And then there will be pictures, examples, non-examples. And for the application ask, it's kind of a little bit reflection. I want to ask them how will they implement these techniques, these activities in their courses when designing and what type of challenges are they expecting and how they are planning to handle with these each challenges mm -hmm. and then um is there an uh, and then how will planning to incorporate these strategies in their design mm -hmm. and for integration i want to do like a post test and i know um and also i want to do them like give them little scenarios for my last day for day and i want them to come up with like a little design just the one activity depending mm -hmm. on the learning outcome they have to come up with something little mm -hmm. and um i definitely support a discussion board if we have a chance but if we um, i definitely support the peer um peer-to-peer -peer feedback and also well, another option, if we cannot do those, we can like, and as an expert, we can create those like a, a good material and first have them create their own and then compare with ours. So okay. it's an option I thought. Mm -hmm. So this is pretty much it, but this is what I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach them those Merrill first design principles by using those principles. That so they sense. will be also seeing example of them and i i'm i'm gonna put plenty of activities plenty um because i believe that i i mean i learn by doing and i believe that so mm -hmm. that's what i'm gonna have them do no i i think this is great and it ties in i think what, what jr um, was mentioning as far as building up to the design plan so if we if you've given them the opportunity to as you're saying create a little application activity or whatever you know whatever it may be however you you, you structure that then you know that, that's almost like their first try <laughs> at designing that um what, what they're going to have ultimately have to do within the within the design plan so i think i think that's great um and then I, I think I was going to mention this, and I didn't with any of the groups. Um, I've, I think I've heard a couple um, of you mention, like, having things to do Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I think we need to think through that. I'm not sure. Do you think we're going to be able to get people's attention on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis, or do you think it's going to be more you uh, open up the content on Monday, let's say, and then they work on things at their own pace with a certain due date by the end of the week? Um, like, what do you think real, my, 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 I'm kind of leading the witness here with my question, I guess, but I just kind of wonder. 
think we we started with that you know Monday Tuesday Wednesday sort of format but like I said before as we started talking it, it turned out that week two really only had like these three parts to it and you know week four might have five parts to it or week three might have four parts to it so we've kind of more part one part two part three and so part one is something that if I have half an hour or or so to sit down and, and engage in the MOOC that I could complete all of part one. And so that might have a small activity attached to it, but that is not defined as on October 14th, you will have this particular thing done. Got it. Okay. So when I'm yeah, hearing, I'm like, sure. okay, got it. So when I'm hearing Monday, you just mean like part one or whatever of your, of your week or whatever. Is it yeah, like exactly. A, okay. Is it like perfect. a suggested schedule then so that we kind of guide them through what they should have or they could have done, you know, to kind of help them along or is that Yeah. Different? Yeah, that I think so. Like start the week off and kind of like like um bo like both Felisa and, and JR were saying with their weeks, you know, that we we consider this there are three parts to this module. They should be done in the 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 order as they're presented, you know, so it all makes sense and and you know, do the activities in the order that you know, they're laid out so they don't just like skip to part three of your week and you know that type of thing but um yeah i think i think we're saying the same thing that's perfect i just when i when i heard monday tuesday wednesdays i was just thinking that you'd open up new content like on a daily basis or whatever i i don't think the intention is to do any kind of lockstep um have any kind of lockstep mechanism built into this i, I think free navigation well, and anyone correct me if I'm if I'm misspeaking, but my mine is not like that. They have to follow the part one, part two, part three. They can just jump into part two, then go back to part one. I'm not planning okay. to design like that, but if it's okay. the thing, I may change it. No, no, that's great. No, that that that's fine. That's actually better. Yeah, I think because I think I just envision most people. Well, and then um, we can talk about this how we release the modules. It was a. Um, suggestion by the canvas folks um, to do it in my you know open up not open up all modules at once um, which I think probably makes sense for what we're, we're doing because then you really could get a free-for-all and people are like on a discussion board for week six and then you know nobody else is there and that you know it, it gets a little bit messy over a longer uh, time frame um, but if we look at things within the context of a module, whether it takes one to two weeks to do it, um, kind of a free for all within the module, I'm, I'm on board with that. Does that make sense to other people as well? Is there any, um, any way to have all of the content for the modules available on day one, but then things like the discussions locked down to, you know, October 6th to 14th or, or whatever the, the week span actually is? I don't know. That's a good question. So they'd be able to see the content. I think the way she showed me, and, and I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Um, she being, um, what was her name? This is terrible. Was it Heather or Hannah? Oh my gosh. I can't believe I don't remember our context name. But anyway, the woman from, uh, from Canvas, um, she had it actually, the module would just be closed until you completed um, some type of activity it, the prior module, then that would open it up. And her thought there too, it, it, that lends itself pretty nicely to doing any type of badging too. Or if you're doing like a progress progression that leads to a badge, you can then see that they've um, ticked all the boxes. But that doesn't necessarily answer your question. And I don't know the answer is like, can you give them the content but not have them do the um, activities? I'm not sure. So we'll look into that. I'll look into that. Yeah, cause I, th I think most LMSs, you should be able to lock down um, activities and discussion boards and I think uh, Jessica just popped in the chat and said that they do it in their campus instance of canvas oh, okay oh, okay that's great Jessica okay very good one thing that um, Felice with your design and I think partially with mine as well since there could be a peer review portion of it um, there could have to be kind of a hard fast date for certain activities that are halfway through. So, you know, for example, in mine, they have to upload something by a specific date in order for the other person to actually be, have a chance to review it in the peer review model. So there could be some hard dates within each individual model just for that specific portion, I think, for the logistics of it. Actually, this is where I want to put everything on Friday. So on the weekends, they may get a chance to work on them if I need to put a hard deadline. Mm -hmm. 
for, for like the peer review piece you mean yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they will have more time to work on it and i don't know it was my thing but thank you josh i will i i really didn't think about it but thank you yeah, so I, I'm just just to summarize yours. I, I I like where you're going. That the as you're saying, you're going to be kind of the, almost modeling what then they'll be doing. You know, saying you're taking them through it and then giving them practice opportunities within uh, within. And I think for all of us, kind of going back to my comment about scope, I think one of the hardest things we're going to do is to keep. This is a, just a tremendous. It's like we're teaching uh, teaching an instructional design 101 class in you know 10 hours or whatever it is. Uh, works out to be um, so we're covering a, a tremendous amount of ground and so just kind of keep that in the back of our minds too as we're doing this like how can we get our point across and give them relevant practice opportunities without um, you know making it a full semester long uh, course so. okay very good thank you um, and Jessica you're next okay so for my week uh, they'll be actually creating or drafting their design document. So um, it kind of ties together and integrates all the knowledge that they've gotten to date. So rather than breaking it down into different parts or pieces, it's really just one that I'm trying to keep as concise as possible, just recognizing that they'll need the majority of their two hours to actually be writing on their own. Mm -hmm. So uh, the week would start with giving them an overview um, video if we can if not then it would just be text-based of all the things that they've learned so far um, and then just kind of covering where those pieces fit within a design plan they'd receive a template um, I'd ask them to start pulling together some of those reflections and activities that they've done in the prior weeks so that they can start seeing where those things can integrate into the template um, so that they can start truly building the demonstration and application pieces would run together, so section by section, just showing them um, what it is, some examples and non-examples, and then having them actually create their own. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the end of the week, they would be submitting their draft, writing a reflection of how that process went for them, what questions they may have. And it just kind of leads into week five where they'd be doing more of the um, revision and mm -hmm. calibration process. So how do you, um, how do those eight, I, we, I threw out those eight sections from what we've done in the past. How do those sit with you? Do you, you have free reign, by the way, if you want to kind of have them take a different approach to the design plan, but um, does, does that, or design proposal, again, nomenclature work, I can even change in my own sentence, I guess, what I'm calling these things, but um, how does that sit with you, those eight sections? This is one of the things we talked about a bit in our last meeting. Um, the things that I'm wondering if can kind of flow together would be sections five, six, and eight. So as they're thinking about structure and sequencing, can we just put it together with engagement and assessment so that it's one mm -hmm. cohesive kind of component that runs through how the lesson would run? So I don't know yet what that piece necessarily looks like. And I'm also realizing after listening to everyone that no one's yet kind of covering the assessment piece. So how to assess your learners. Mm -hmm. Or if it's there, it's maybe just not something we've talked about. But right. so I'm wondering if we either need to work that into yeah. one of the earlier weeks or if that's something that will be left. Yeah, good point. Good to point. kind of cover. So, Felice, does your week cover anything on assessment? I, I just never actually thought about that myself either. Um, I, want to, I, I was planning to put a little bit post-tests and also um, for the deadline – for like, I, w I was gonna give them one little activity and then they will be um, working on their paper. Then I was gonna put an expert like it, like the a document that supposed to be like, I know how to describe it, but like created by an expert and they can compare theirs and see what they are missing. This was kind of my assessment method or the peer review. Um, but I, 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 but not, we, there was really, um, let's go back to the, your, your, so there's, I think to get to Jessica's point though, you mean like, I think we, it's typically lip, uh, lumped under that application piece where like, uh, 
the assessment is more like assessment of their practice activities versus like a true assessment. Like, did they um, accomplish what, <laughs> are they ready to go on to the next level, right? I think, go ahead. Oh, um, isn't it the post test kind of tells me if they're yeah. ready to move on? Yeah, and so you do have a section on that in your section? Yes, I do. I'm planning okay. to have posters. Okay. So I think um, maybe more of what I was meaning was we're not really teaching them how to assess their own students or not right. talking to them about how to assess their learners. Uh, is, does it go to my section? Like, should I talk about the assessment as well? I never told about that, but I will be happy to cover. Um, um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's fine. Sorry. Well, here's how we did it. Yes, and again, a lot of this is just you know being borrowed from our prior. Um, our client, uh, Grace Centers of Hope, ha used the TABE test, and, and so they just used a computerized test to, to determine where the learner was falling in the, the ranges. And so they were just using our materials to kind of backfill where the students were lacking, you know, skills and knowledge in areas. And then we, we, we just had the, any type of assessment we had was related to like the practice activities that were within the module, not necessarily like, you know, have they met, you know, like a post test or, you know, a test at the end of the activity to say, okay, now are they, have they completed um, this sufficiently to go on to the next level? So I think it's a kind of a, I'm kind of talking in circles, but it's kind of a matter of degree of how much uh, we want to get into assessment. Um, do we want to talk about assessment in the context of have they mastered the objectives of our individual lesson versus kind of the bigger picture of like the TABE test assessment? Um, so in the they, module five, I have, um, I touch on, uh, just because it's evaluation, I couch it all in Kirkpatrick's levels of evaluation, but I think that might be a bit late since they've already had in, in uh, Jennifer's section, they probably have already developed that. So, I, I mean, it could come after, the fact if that makes sense like it could be rolled into my section too okay well let, let's go back let, let's talk let's kind of I'll talk about this a second so I guess in the past if I had to critique our <laughs> work for designers for learning we very much have glossed over assessment beyond being something that is basically feedback for the activities being done in the lesson what I'm very look, much looking for feedback from others. What do you think that section, how much, how, how deep should we get into this idea of assessment for this group of learners? I guess what I had envisioned really was just, um, have they had the opportunity to practice? And then do they have some kind of an activity at the end of this brief 30 minute lesson that lets them know that they got it? So it doesn't have, at least in the way I've been thinking about it, it doesn't have to be any intricate assessment. Yeah. It can really just be something really small and focused directed just towards whatever objectives and standards they picked. And typically when I think about teaching the design process, it would be here, you know, here are your objectives and how they align to the standards. And then immediately, how are you going to assess that objective? Yes. So maybe before we start talking about the instructional experience, and I know we talked a little bit about maybe stretching Stacy's week you know, that week two into two separate weeks, mm -hmm. that may be an opportunity to add that piece in with, you know, now we've talked about the standards and you've picked an objective or a goal. How will you assess it? Okay. I like it. I don't know. Yeah. And then we can revisit it in Felice's section then when she's having them think through what their activities are, right? To, yeah. to refine that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I, I think that kind of makes sense too with, with week two because those OER repositories do off, like you can break out assessments from instructional activities. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, uh, I think the, the big point with assessment is that uh, out of all OER things, it's kind of the area that's really lacking. So having any kind of uh, any question banks or any kind of assessment activities is the one space that, that the OER space is, is lacking more in than instructional activities or than in uh, kind of textbook um, type resources. So, okay. 
So I'm going to put in my notes. So we're going to touch on, and we've got to think how we're going to do this uh, to, to Jessica's point, link the assessment with the objectives, like think through you've got your objectives. So how are you going to assess that they've mastered them is one piece of it. And then piece two would be within Felice's section um, um, that, let's see, where was that? Under the applica or application piece. Um, and the integration really, actually, yeah, application and integration kind of going together, that there is some component of assessment there as well. Um, and it's more assessment as part of the learning activity versus necessarily mastery. Of, it's not really an, a mastery assessment necessarily, but to, to, um, to, but to support the learning that occurs during the application integration piece. Does that make sense? No? <laughs> I think it does. Okay. Okay. Well, let's do that. So let's go and I'll also make a note. No, so we're not going to get into the assessment in terms of like the tape testing and things like that, right? We're going to skip that. Do you think there's any value to doing that or would that be something, I guess actually Eric could maybe touch on that in the context piece that that's how people are kind of leveled, like what level they're at. I guess my immediate thought is I wonder if that restricts the usefulness of our, our information. Like, does that narrow the focus a bit or is that going to apply to anyone who would be using the lessons that people create? Like, is, I guess that's just me not being familiar with whether or not those tests are broadly used. Yeah, I, mean. yeah, I do. Yeah, I think they are. You know, we, and I'll have to go back to the SMEs thing because some were saying that their state is not using TABE, it's some other name or whatever it is. But I think that's a pretty standard practice when people walk in the door, they give it, they hit them up with these assessments um, to figure out where they're at because they may be at a certain level in reading and a different re level in math. And then they kind of go from there in terms of what resources and, and instruction they provide them. Um, okay. but you know what, I'm, for the for interest of time, I'm going to just put a big question mark that and I'll, re, I'll, I'll regroup on that. Um, okay, very good. That's, that's excellent. And then, um, so you're comfortable making the revisions you want to make, right? As far as like combining set six and seven or whatever it may be, or I guess it was seven and eight. Whatever. Sure. Yeah. So Jessica, would you uh, also like to, so you're going to create like the template for that, that as well? Yeah, and that was something I wanted to touch base with you on to see if there were any, you know, especially good examples from prior offerings or things that we can kind of pull from that have already proven to be really useful to people in the field, like things that worked really well at Grace or things that, um, yeah, that you know what, it's, you. I don't know. Um, okay, well, let, you know what, this is kind of a broader discussion, but I'm just going to go there for a second, because this is, this has really <laughs> been a sticking point in general. We have a, there's a huge disconnect. Once someone prepares the written design proposal, and then they go to the next stage to create the prototype, and I think it might be part of it is just the natural evolution of when you're designing something, you have a conception in your head, and then when it actually pen to paper, it, it changes. Um, but it's a very messy process. Um, and a lot of times the students complain, oh, we poured our heart and soul into this written plan. And then at the end of the day, that's not, you know, when we put it uh, in the proposal or the uh, prototype stage, you know, either we did too much work or we, we went a different direction or whatever it may be. You know, we, like I said, we, in the past, we did a written design plan that then m morphed into a, a prototype. So I guess John or anybody else who does a lot of design work, how does this sit with you that we're asking them to do a written design proposal that then they'll turn into a prototype? Just in general, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a blank question. I have no problem with it, Jennifer. I mean, I, I'm a big fan. You know how I am. I'm a big fan that the more things that you actually produce while you're designing, the better off you are. Um, and if you do a proposal with a design document, I, I just think that that get your thoughts down in what direction you want to go to that point. And then if you're going to move on, then you work with the prototype, but now you're just building on what you already have. I mean, you know, the difference between, you know, the difference between a prototype and the design document is just a low fidelity um, type of external representation of what you're doing. And um, I, I, I have no problem with it. I, in fact, I, I like that process that's already been set up. And Jessica, what do you do at work? Do you guys ever do written design proposals or do you guys just kind of jump right into a, a prototype? 
Uh, we, we keep a lot of documentation, but it's not as formal as this. So um, it's lesson by lesson. We do have some, some templating, but um, it's definitely so, something we stick to. So it's a lot of, a lot of mapping objectives to assessments, but I think, so I guess one of the things we could do is if there were design documents that were especially well done, we could use those without showing the final product. So then, you know, maybe in part two of the MOOC, when they move on to creating their prototypes, that may even be something useful to show the learners that this is a process that evolves. And you might have started with a design document that looks like A, and you end up with a final product that's Z. <laughs> we do have that. From prior okay. sessions, we definitely have... It's just a really painful process because what we would have done in the past is we would do a, a, a layer of evaluation after they turned in their written proposals and they would just get, you know, torn apart, <laughs> which they do. Okay. You know, it's kind of like what we're doing here, but with a bunch of office designers and scope would be too long and, you know, the, the assessments didn't align or their activities didn't align with the objectives or whatever it may be. <laughs> and um, But I think that's sort of the natural part of the design process that those things kind of that happens kind of like John said you have different representations as you go along and, and things mm -hmm. naturally evolve um, but <clears throat> I really um, I would love to see any examples if you think you can is there anything you can borrow from what you do that would help to streamline some of this I, I liked your idea of the like the mapping piece without it being I guess I keep resisting in general this idea of like a template that people are filling in the blanks in but um, that's kind of why intuitively we like those eight kind of vague sections and then you free form, you know, what you think should be in there rather than making it, you know, here's an objective and here, here's the assessment that, or the activity that would be supporting that objective and here's the assessment all in like an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Um, right. But do, yeah, I mean, uh, I'll take a look. Um, I don't know how much I have, but I'm wondering too, there's got to be some things out there, I would imagine, that, that can be really useful in this process. And I think as a group, we can Yeah, does anybody you know, else? Too. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything at work that they use for this stage that, that we could borrow from? Well, okay, we'll, we'll table this, but <laughs> this always is a sticking point. We have, I'm sure I can go back to a webinar from, you know, a year ago or two years ago. We're having the same conversation. But what should we include in the design proposal? So, okay, very good. So, Jessica, you're totally on the right track. And then, you know, just keep working on refining it. And on, an, on our next meeting, we'll just talk about, like, the components and you know, what holes you may feel you need plugged. Okay, sounds good. Is, that, is it okay? Is that giving you enough? Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. Okay. And do you guys mind if we go another 15 minutes? Is that okay? Yep, I'm good by that. That's yep, good. Okay, we'll try to wrap up in about 15 minutes. So, Josh, you're on. Okay. Um, well, mine might change based on, I uh, unfortunately had a family emergency, so I missed the actual meeting, but JR was nice enough to um, to fill me in on some of the stuff and, and uh, kind of be a sounding board for you know my ideas so um <clears throat> the it starts uh, uh trying to um couch it in some theory and some contextualization for the students so uh using kirkpatrick's four levels or uh i thought phillips fifth but i don't think that's really appropriate um so there's a short overview um i, I have a stock lecture that could be adapted um uh, an interactive one that has some questioning and things uh, that kind of gives an overview of the ev evaluation, um, which I think might lean more towards what we were talking about earlier with the assessment component. So uh, being a level two evaluation. Um, uh, anyway, uh, this can all change too. So uh, having them reflect on those particular levels and identifying ones that um, they're familiar with since they have experience with this. So, um, uh, you know, this experience in and of itself, this module would be a level two evaluation and, and, and so on. Um, and then uh, I wanted them, ultimately I want them to peer review each other's uh, results from the fourth module. Mm -hmm. um, so to do that, uh, you know, I, I assume that there would be some kind of, um, that we could develop some kind of rubric that would match the um, whatever deliverable uh, that we decide upon um, that could then 
be kind of a quality check for the, uh, the end result of the OER submission. So, um, and then using the students to kind of uh, check one another, uh, hopefully to limit some of the, um, the instructor uh, uh, workload and, and allowing the students the opportunity to, uh, to provide some of those QA checks. Um, so um, I had in there, uh, after our conversation before, I had in there, uh, you know, level one, but I don't think that's appropriate anymore. Um, so having them do kind of a smile sheet uh, for their session, like writing one up, but I think it might be more uh, advantageous to do a, a self-assessment. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, and, and that's um, that's kind of what, what I was saying before when we did the, um, and you brought up a great point. We haven't talked about it at all. Um, we are going to have about 10 facilitators. And so as we're thinking through our activities, um, you know, think of ways that we can use them to, but like, as you're saying, if we have 600 students or whatever it may be, uh, so self-assessments, uh, self-evaluation is, is going to be important too. But I, I really like your idea that, you know, from Je Jessica's week, they're going to have created the design um, proposal and then take a week to self-reflect on um, have you met, met the key um, ideas of, of what you should be doing and before what we did is we had a an, um, survey monkey online survey that went out to the clients and so we're, I guess we have to kind of think of we're not obviously going to have a client and so can they do to what extent are they going to be able to self evaluate <laughs> the, the quality of their design proposal yeah. right yeah so kind of uh, you know their evaluation they pair up um, with another student, the student evaluates them, then they s summarize that and kind of, um, uh, you know, distill that down and make changes in the end to their uh, end to that document. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, I was, my intention was to use a um, discussion board. So each student posts their uh, final document or, you know, their draft document, I guess, in this case. Uh, and then it's kind of a self-assigned groups where you find somebody that hasn't had a review done yet, pick that person, and then you review their materials for them. Mm -hmm. um, or you kind of claim dibs on somebody. So, again, limiting the, the workload for the instructors and not having to manage the groups. Um, no. That sounds great. And then just to, um, and Jessica, I guess I forgot you were familiar with Canvas. There is a peer, like once you turn in as an assignment, if they did it instead of using the discussion board, I think an option too is you can have them turn the assignment in and make it a peer, uh, a requirement that they have to peer review someone else's work. Um, and I, the only thing was that the, the Canvas contact cautioned us against that in a MOOC because by this point in the MOOC, we may only have, you know, I know maybe now we're now down to like a hundred people or seventy people or whatever it may be. Um, and this, you know, you may not have the people who turn in their design proposal may not be around in week five to uh, to peer critique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm wondering. I think you can set it up so they have to do a certain number of them too, right? So you could even have have them do two peer reviews as long as the documentation is not too long. Mm -hmm. um, I know I took a, one of the MIT MOOCs had a really neat calibration system too, where it would show you some samples and then you would rate it and then it would show you the professional feedback that, that an expert had given. And so you did two of them that way before you were allowed to peer review others. So, I mean, I know that might be a time issue, but I thought that was a really effective way to that's yeah, really cool. Yeah. So then they had the so they had a, a design in our case they'd have a design proposal and then um, two experts who had done a critique of it and then they were able to use that as what the criteria would be for for their own self assessment. Is that what you're saying? Um, no. So they would try to evaluate it on their own and then they would see once they had evaluated it they would be able to see the expert feedback to see how oh, their review okay. compared. And then, then they could go and peer review someone else's documentation once they knew kind of yeah. how an expert review looked. I like love a that. sample document that, that then adaptively releases after they submit the review. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. I love that idea, though. Do you like that idea, Josh, where um, they would see, they would have the opportunity to, to do a, an evaluation of, like a, a sample, right, Jessica? I hope I'm yeah. saying this quickly. And then, yeah. um, and then from there, see how the experts reviewed it. 
Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I've used that before too, and I, I think that it worked well for me. So I think, you know, uh, the only consideration that I have is uh, time constraints. So uh, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Jessica. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that would be my only worry. And I wonder to, if we need to, like I'm wondering if our weeks can blur a little together. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of the same kind of, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I don't know, just something to think about if that, if that's something we need to offload differently. Yep. Okay. Well, yep. and the, the one thing that I recall from the short conversation Josh and I had was um, what the facilitator's role in that could be. So one would be somebody peer reviewed mine and I'm not happy with how that went. And so they trigger a facilitate a facilitator to go in and, and look and provide feedback, but also to speak to canvas's concern about uh, you know, if people aren't around in week five and that some don't get peer reviewed, then with our 10 facilitators, uh, we would be able to kind of look through and start picking off ones that hadn't been uh, reviewed yet. Mm -hmm. But really trying to encourage, you know, you're just reviewing one. That's not a big, you know, it's not a huge task. Uh, go and just kind of pick one that um, that hasn't been reviewed yet and, and provide a review. Yeah. So I, I, I like a couple of great things came out of this. So I love the calibration thing. And then Josh, I, we kind of abandoned it, but I think we can definitely consider still consider thinking about the discussion board incorporating like post yours. It, it maybe even ties into what uh, JR was saying. If you just feel like, you know what, I still feel like I want more feedback. <laughs> and so then you could post it to the discussion board saying, can somebody take a peek at this or whatever. Um, One piece I had in, um, in uh, under the meaningful evaluation section is that um, the students to, to write up a, a brief summary and kind of describe where they agree and disagree. So if there was a discrepancy between what the student thought in the evaluation they got back or maybe the other person mm -hmm. You know, it kind of, it, it gets them thinking about what they have just done uh, as well. Yeah. So that's summation of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So excellent. So I think I like, I like also Jessica's idea of, you know, you guys can kind of blend your topics um, or your, your material over a couple different weeks. Um, excellent. Good, good start. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts um, up to this point? And then, as you notice, we have like a bunch of other weeks to, <laughs> to tackle, and I got to start thinking about that. Um, and I think a lot of this will start borrowing from what we did in the past, as far as developing the prototypes and stuff. Um, so at this point, these remaining weeks are are on my um, on my plate. So I guess the big question is, um, when do we meet next, and what are we going to try to get accomplished in uh, before our next meeting? Do we want to? I guess. Uh, First and foremost, we have to figure out some type of um, uh, style guide, right, for how we're going to, as designers, how we're going to start putting pen to paper. Um, and so I guess that will fall on me. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I, Jessica, you've worked with um, with Canvas a little bit. It, it's, it's pretty much like what we're used to, I'm assuming, where we can import videos and or embed videos or whatever it may be. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on this next step of like putting pen to paper, like some ways that we can do it as a group <laughs> without having six different voices um, coming off the page. Any thoughts on that? Um, there, there are kind of two spaces. Stacy had uploaded a, um, sorry, I've got the chat window in the way here. It's the uh, high level design document Okay. Where we have kind of the general outline of module, and so it says module one, dissecting the instructional opportunity. There's the objectives in the far left column, and then kind of what the part one, part two, part three, et cetera, looks like, uh -huh. um, but really at a high level. So kind of like the read, reflection, activity, assessment um, head headers. Uh -huh. And the other piece that I had uploaded just for our group to look at uh, was a module template, which just outlined some of the headings. So things like uh, the module topics, context summary, relevance to practice, um, learning materials, learning highlights, review questions, glossary, copyright, et cetera. So like a really basic one, but, uh, and a comprehensive attribution statement. So a really basic one, um, but this that's great. I had not seen if, this. If everybody kind of dumped into the one space, then um, the approach that I'm using in, in an open textbook is that we can all see it at the same time and that um, the authors are kind of saying, 
uh, immediately, oh, you know, are we doing this in second person or third person or like what kinds of, are we using contractions or not contractions and being able to see everybody's work in one space um, is helping to control the voice a little bit. Okay, I love it. Okay, so how would this work? So this is your, the, the I'm on your um, module template. So would this then be take, expanded so everybody's module was on the same, like this is just a template, right? And so we'd have to create another document where we'd start actually populating it with our module content, right? Yeah, so there's kind of the two two approaches you could take. One is that uh, this would be at the top, and then the five modules would be just a copy and paste of the same template, and that would become one long form, or that they would just copy this template, and we'd have six documents, or five documents, six okay. documents that uh, represent each module. Does anybody have a preference? First of all, does everybody, I kind of, I like, I haven't really obviously had a chance to look at beyond the last three seconds, but I like the concept. So this is my idea of a style guide, which thank God you've already done it because I was kind of getting <laughs> freaked out going, how am I going to do this? Um, so does everybody like this general concept of having this as our style guide? And then the next question being, um, would you like to create your own as your own document or should we have it all as one run on do document? Any thoughts on that? I would, I'd prefer uh, a long document with sections that way, because I think, uh, you know, as, as we were talking earlier with Jessica, you know, some of them blend together and it would be helpful to see the reference material as we create and just an easy reference. Okay. Yeah, and then at the top, we could just, I could just um, create a, a table of contents because Google Docs allows you to link to headers. Um, so as long as you're using heading one, heading two, then it can just link right from that first page down to say week three. Okay. I love it. I love it. And this actually uh, overcomes a problem that um, the Canvas folks are saying, if we just kind of do a free for all, just going in to start populating Canvas as our prototype, she said that usually doesn't work very well. So she definitely suggested that we do it first on another platform first. I'm a big fan of copy paste. Yeah. And Jessica, that works pretty well too. The copy paste is you no know, like weird formatting goofiness when you try to copy paste? No, it should pull everything in pretty well. We haven't had any problems with it. I copy paste for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that was too easy. That was way too easy. <laughs> All right. So let's make, let's, let's do this. How much time do, what, what should we start? How, how much do we want to try to accomplish before our next meeting? Let's say we try to meet in the next, the other group is meeting in two weeks. Um, because Jessica and I, I know John and Jessica, and I'm not sure who else is also going to AACT, so that's creeping in here as well. Um, let's, can we look at our calendars really quick? Um, the other group is meeting on the 29th. What do you think, do you think within two weeks, should we take a stab at at least getting one document together and start putting in the, filling in those sections for our, uh, respective weeks? And just see how far we get in two weeks. That sounds fun. Yeah. You want, you want to give it a try? Yeah. We have to start sometime, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, JR, do you want to take the? Um, would you mind doing that? Uh, making it so you've got the sections for each week or module rather um, available. Would that be? Yeah, for sure. I can. So, what I'll do, guys, is uh, I'll make a, a table of contents up front, and then it'll link down to. Um, just replicas of, of what you see right now for week one, or I guess week zero, week one, week two, et cetera. Yep. Um, the one thing I'll note is that uh, Google Docs itself, we can't embed um, like YouTube videos or anything in it. Um, so, but you know, you can still just link to, link it, to it here. And then when we build it in Canvas, we can, we can actually do the embedding. Um, that's one hang up I've run into so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is huge. I'm very happy about this. So let's, can we put it on our calendar? Um, the tw is that okay with everybody? The 28th, same time uh, that we were this week, 6 p.m. Eastern, or I'm sorry, 6 p.m. Central on the 28th. Does that work? Works for me. Okay. Well, very good. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for your, your hard work and your thoughts that you've pulled together. This has been 
much more productive than I, <laughs> you've exceeded my expectations. So this is wonderful. And I had high expectations, so that's great. Um, and if you do have any individual questions, please feel free to con contact me. I've talked to a lot of people offline separately. So um, if that becomes something you want to do, I'm, I'm always around for that. And thank you again for your service. Can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'll sign off and um, talk to you in two weeks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.